actually dog saliva on the microphone. So we're sitting here in the studio with our two dogs. When did you actually get your dog? Almost exactly a year ago. Last March, March 2021. March 2021. So we got Margot a year before that, March 2020. So both like middle of the pandemic. COVID dogs. Yeah. COVID dogs. Definitely. In fact, one survey done earlier this year suggested an estimated 3 million pets joined Canadian homes through the course of the pandemic. Yeah, that's a lot. It's crazy. So your dog's name is Blanca. Blanca. Do you feel like Blanca got you through tough times? So much so. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) So how... (laughs) <laughs> how, so, how not feel, so much right now <laughs> yeah, how, aside from the stress of trying to record a podcast when a dog is barking why do you feel like Blanca got you through tough times she you know she was the reason I got out and got outside the reason I got out of bed like there was nothing to do for a long time other than sit at home and even a joyous little furry creature to laugh at while you're sitting at home made all the difference for me you feel like your dog actually improved your mental health 100,000 million percent. Which we're asking this because this episode is going to debut on the Monday of National Mental Health Week. And we have this theory that dogs helped people get through the pandemic, get through the tough times of the pandemic, and that actually dogs and mental health, like that yeah. they're, you know, that there's a connection maybe somewhere there. So you are like an unadulterated, yes, my dog helped me get through yeah. the pandemic. And I am on, I'm not exactly on the other side. I'm just maybe more skeptical. Right. Like there are times that my dog legit does add to my stress. Right. And sometimes I I come home from a a day and I don't want to walk the dog. I want to read my book. Yeah. I just want to read my book. That's uh, fair. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure that letting my daughter convince the rest of us to get a dog was the right play for For us. For your mental health. Right. So the question of dogs and mental health. Do you own a dog today? And do you feel like the dog helped get you through the pandemic? Do you feel like a dog helps you with your mental health? Does your dog add to your stress? Or maybe you're considering adopting a pet. Like which one should you get for your mental health? Those are the questions that we'll be exploring today. And we have Dan McCann of the legendary McCann Dogs Obedience Training Family here to explore it with social worker and animal lover, Samantha Charon, who is MedCan's clinical lead of mental health. I'm Chris Shulgin. I'm Eat Move Thinks executive producer. I'm Jasmine Ratch. I'm Eat Move Thinks managing producer. Dan McCann is a dog trainer who has a lifelong love for the special bond between dogs and humans. His family business, McCann Dogs, is one of the world's largest dog training schools and dog brands globally, with more than 100,000 dogs trained in live classes and millions trained via their online classes and McCann Dogs training YouTube channel. And they're almost at 1 million subscribers, actually, on that channel, which is a super helpful resource for new or old pet owners who are looking to touch up their dog's behavioral issues or obedience. Like it's a really helpful resource full of little quick, easy videos to watch. So I'm really excited about this episode. I want to hear the argument. I want to hear Dan's argument that dogs are good for your mental health. I want to hear his tips. Shall we get to it? Let's throw it to Samantha Charon. Dan, I'm really excited to be sitting here with you today. I feel like we're combining two of the things that I enjoy the most, which are animals and the topic of mental health. With that being said, how's your day going? And it's really great to finally put a face to the name. Thank you so much. Likewise. And I'm so thrilled to be here talking on a a topic that's similarly passionate for me. My day is going great. The best days for me start with a slow morning and a couple of dog cuddles before a coffee. And I was able to get that in with my uh, just over a one-year-old border collie, Euchre. So Today's been a great start already. As a person that feels like they're very puppy and dog deprived, that's very enticing. (laughs) (laughs) Dan, I know that your family has a long history of having a relationship with dogs. Um, How has being in that environment really shaped the way that you view dogs and your relationship with them? Yeah. Now looking back on my childhood, recognize how unique and special it was to grow up with 10 dogs in A family business that a lot of my parents, friends, and even family members thought was kind of crazy that they were starting a dog training business. And it kind of became this sort of field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. And we got more and more people interested in in learning from uh, my parents as they started to really get into dog training as a hobby. 
you know, my mom had been running aquatic centers and learned about teaching swimming and teaching people and programming. And my dad had been pursuing uh, sports and was actually trying out to play professional baseball and he had open heart surgery. And um, when that happened, it totally shook up their lives. And he was able to go back to his regular day-to-day life, but not pursue sports. And so my mom and him kind of took that passion for being world-class at anything you do and apply it to the hobby of dog training. And they went on to um, become pretty well known in the dog training world 40 years ago and now have trained over 100,000 dogs in our facilities outside of Toronto. And my eldest sister, Kale, who uh, grew up really in the in the heat of the business uh, being developed, has gone on to become a 21-time world champion in dog agility. So she's... Uh, wow. Yeah. She's incredible at what she does. She loves it. She found her passion at a really young age. And with her expertise and her personality and, and skill set and her husband... We've actually built out a YouTube channel where we put out content every week to help people do something awesome with their four-legged family member. And it's been a labor of love since 2010 when it started. And it was slow initially. And over time, um, it's just grown and grown. And we're proud that hopefully this year we'll cross the million subscriber number on our YouTube channel, which is just so exciting because it's getting really important content to dog lovers all over the world so that they have the resources to um, improve their relationships with their dogs, do more things, enjoy hobbies, and pursue a really fulfilling relationship with their four-legged family member. It's amazing that everybody in your family can share that bond as well and that you all have an interest in it. Yeah, it is. And I, I think dogs and our relationships with dogs has impacted all of our personalities in a way. I have friends that joke with me that my spirit animal is a border collie <laughs> and I I definitely have that aspect and you know wherever I go uh, I was recently traveling in Mexico and friends would smile and smirk and walk on as I fell in love with a rescue dog here and there and uh you know it's just a, it's a big part of of my heart and my personality and who I am and the same would go for each one of my siblings, um, my sister Lexi and my sister Kale and, and our whole family. It's a broad statement to say that dogs can improve our mental health. Can you talk us through a bit about what it's like to be a dog owner and what exactly a dog might contribute to our overall mental health? Sure. Yeah. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is that quintessential scene of dog owner coming through the door and a loyal, loving, passionate, excited dog wagging tail meeting them on the other side. To me, at the highest level, that is what makes a good life. Those those moments are sort of great, good enough moments that I know I kind of uh, count the, the, the meaning of my life in, and I try and take a pause and a breath to really appreciate those moments. Of course, dog ownership comes with many different aspects. And what I really love is that in good times and in bad, we can turn to our pets for comfort, for joy, for support, And I think that there is such a diversity of relationships we can have with dogs. Certainly companionship, love, affection, the impact that a dog can have on your well-being and your sort of sense of meaning is something that some people call the pet effect. And I think the pet effect is something that most of us just naturally feel. I know I do. Yeah. I guess if I were to try and sum it up, what I love the most about dogs is that they model for us how to be better people. whether you're struggling with a mental illness or not. They tend to assume the best, are quick to play and bring out that childish sense of wonder, are resilient in overcoming bad or difficult experiences, and then they rest when they need to, (laughs) which I don't know about you, but I think if we could all do that, it would be amazing to be so much present-minded like dogs. Yeah, I was just about to say, it sounds like a very grounding experience. And when we think about, you know, looking for those pockets of sunshine Mm -hmm. in our days, like Mm -hmm. having your dog greet you, regardless of, you know, what's going on in your day. That's very sentimental and grounding, and it brings us back into that present moment. So that leads me Mm -hmm. to, you know, my next question in regards to depression and anxiety. Like, do you feel like dogs, especially because you work with so many of them, can diagnose health issues within their owners? Interesting question. I don't know whether they can diagnose health issues. I think that might be better left to the professionals like yourself, but I certainly think that they can have an incredible impact on those that are struggling with a whole range of different challenges or emotions. You know, for me, 
uh, if I were to just sort of sum up at a higher level, typically folks that are in a depressed state are stuck in the past and ruminating on past thoughts. And those that are anxious are, you know, worrying and future forecasting. And exactly like you said, when you have another being that's relying on you that, in fact, if you don't take it out every two hours or so, might pee on your floor, it can be an incredibly grounding and uh, an experience that brings you into the present moment. Absolutely. I think pets and therapy animals can alleviate stress, anxiety, depression, certainly feelings of loneliness and social isolation. And beyond that, they can help us open up to other humans, making sort of that icebreaking conversation, whether you're riding an elevator in an apartment building or whether you're at a local park. Not only is it limited to our relationship with our four-legged family members, as we like to say, but also with our ability to connect with the world around us. Yeah. So I think you actually hit the nail on the head with that. It's really funny because there's a lot of correlations. When I'm sitting down with a client, something that we often review together is a document called a self-care assessment. Mm. And it sounds like what a dog can provide to us is exactly what that self-care assessment touches upon. So in order to make sure that we're living a holistic lifestyle that is covering everything we need to be uh, mentally well, mm -hmm. it is structuring a routine, having things that we can fall back upon, mm -hmm. you know, exercise, mm -hmm. belonging to a community, having something that we can fall back on and mm -hmm. a purpose, which it sounds like a dog gives us all of those things as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I've certainly experienced in my life and in my immediate circle and in things that I've read that pets and dogs can provide a sense of essential meaning in lives, which is a pretty incredible thing. So I need to ask because I'm an animal lover through and through, not just with dogs and the age old rivalry of dogs versus cats. How are dogs better for our mental health and well-being versus a cat? I'm not too sure if that's an appropriate way to word it or not, but I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Sure. Well, it's funny. I think in my younger years, I might have been uh, staunchly on the dog team only. And as I've aged, I think I appreciate the different aspects that a whole slew of animals can provide. And, you know, beyond dogs and cats, you know, horses are known for equine therapy and a whole range of different therapeutic possibilities are possible through humans relationships with animals. When it comes to dogs and cats, I would say the single biggest difference from my perspective is the level of interactivity that you get with a dog. You can do a lot more things that are interactive together. At the same time, I don't want to split the audience with that age-old debate. People might be surprised to know that my family, growing up with 10 dogs, we also had a cat or two over the years. And many of our, our staff members and professional dog trainers are equal uh, lovers of, of uh, a variety of animals. So at the end of the day, I think both can be great sources of companionship. And it really comes down to the fit between energies, right. the fit between your lifestyle and what you're looking out of a relationship with, with an animal. Wow. 10 dogs. Yeah. Growing up in a household, 10 dogs. That's wild. Almost consistently throughout all of my youth. Unfortunately, animals don't last forever. And so there, there was um, a lot of different dogs that I was very close to over, over my life and you know, I look back now, it didn't, it just seemed like a, a very normal thing to me. Right. <laughs> but I look back now and, and people make that comment of, you know, what an interesting and, and fortunate childhood. And I certainly was surrounded by many more dogs than that in our family business, because we had at times, you know, seven or 800 dogs a week coming to our training facilities. And I uh, definitely would say, looking back now that my connection to, to animals and to dogs reaches into a pretty deep place in my soul and self-identity in terms of the, the man that I am today. I joke sometimes with friends if they're talking about love languages that there's a sixth one for me, uh, which is showing and expressing love through dogs because that's certainly a big part of how I grew up. My partner and I, we've been thinking about getting our first puppy together. He's had dogs in the past and I've always been a dog lover, so it just felt natural for us to want to do that. Amazing. So we are currently of the mindset that the dog picks the owner in some ways when it comes to personalities. Do you have any you know, advice for people that are first time dog owners, I guess, together, because I'm a first time dog owner, but he's had two Weimaraners in the past right. yeah. that are, you know, looking to expand their small family and like, what advice would you give them? 
Absolutely. I mean, this in my world is actually the age old question. Okay. From as young as I remember, the main question that folks would ask me when they learned a little bit about my family background was what type of breed should I get? And the truth is it's an incredibly personal question that is going to be different for everybody. So it really has a lot to do with your lifestyle and your goals. Some breeds are more inclined to bond strongly with humans than others. Having said that, uh, every dog's an individual, so there's always going to be exceptions. And it really depends on, on what you're looking for. You need to consider a number of different characteristics like energy level, size of dog, coat type, grooming requirements, you know, general temperament. You know, if you're an active person, then you might want to choose a dog that's a, of a more active breed. And if you're someone who likes more quiet time and, and relaxation, then choosing a breed that doesn't require as much exercise would be really smart in terms of your future success and, and happiness together. It really does more than anything else come down between the fit in, in personalities. Yeah, that, that's really good advice. And what about those people that are kind of on the fence? Like they don't know if taking on the responsibility is for them. Like what are some telltale signs that you're really ready to jump into this investment? Because it's more than owning an animal. It's a member of your family to a degree. Absolutely. And I think it's clear from our conversation already that we're both, we're both dog lovers and uh, getting a dog can certainly be rewarding and enjoyable. And at the same time, there, there are a set of considerations that are important beyond just good intentions. You know, I think right now we've seen one of the biggest puppy rushes yeah. in recent history. And I'm simultaneously thrilled about that and hopeful that those dogs will continue to have their needs met over their lifetime. So the key things to think about, I would say probably three things. Do you have the time that's going to be required for caretaking? And are you prepared for that responsibility to take on the challenges of owning a dog? Because it is a huge time commitment. Secondly, you want to think about if you're prepared to take on the training challenges that come with owning a dog, because properly training a dog isn't actually as easy as most people assume, and it takes time and know-how. Each dog is an individual, so they're going to have individual training needs. And then you hit on this, but it also is an investment. You know, there's it's a serious expense that goes along with owning a dog. Everything from potentially an initial purchase cost, depending on where you're getting the dog from, food and medical bills and supplies, proper training, perhaps veterinary or emergency care, possible boarding, grooming. You know, there's, there's really so many different aspects. And it would be hard to sort of come up with an accurate guess, but just for... Uh, the sake of putting a number out there, I would imagine that it's probably at least $3,000, maybe $5,000 a year, depending on your spending habits and where you're located in the world. And if you look at about 10 years, you could be looking at anywhere between thirty dollars and $50,000 on, on the dog as well. So it shouldn't be something that you rush into or you just decide on a whim. And I think the most important thing is to really make sure that the needs are being met on both ends of the leash. Yeah. What can you do for that dog? How can you show up for it and improve its life? And we know that the opposite will be true in return. Yeah. And for people that are first time owners, like when I think about myself and becoming a dog mom, eventually my mind automatically goes to like, I need to puppy proof the house and get all of the wires out of the way, make sure my backyard is fenced in. Like, what are some things that first time owners should be doing to prepare their house for not only a puppy, but an older dog if they're bringing one into the home as well? Yeah, you know, that's such a common question. Oh, for- we actually created a, uh, a puppy prep guide because we've had many folks reach out and say, I'm a first time owner and I don't have the dog yet, but I just want to know exactly what we can do. But I would say the highlights on this, you're, you're starting to think about it. How can you set up your house and the environment so that the animal is in a environment to be set up for success? We love to say that early training is easy training. And those first six months are so crucial to develop your relationship and the bond with the animal. And the main thing is actually supervision. It really is. It's in the early days, especially 100% supervision is what's required to keep them safe and to make sure that they aren't getting into trouble or making mistakes that could otherwise be avoided because what a dog learns first, they learn best. And so when you actually unpack what that means, there are a number of tools that can help you to make that 100% supervision possible because, of course, we live in a day and age with so many distractions and stimulations that it can actually be pretty hard to, to achieve that. So 
having a, a crate that the dog stays in from the very first night and they get used to as a comforting sort of denning environment is an incredibly valuable and practical management tool. Then when you can't be fully present, uh, having that crate and having it be a safe space for the dog to relax is going to be one of the best things you can do for both of you. Sometimes people like to get baby gates or use an X-Pen to cordon off areas of the house so that they can actually limit the dog's freedom in sort of where they can get into. Maybe there are some stuff that you aren't going to put away and you want to make sure that they aren't going to get into that. But it's not a replacement for supervision. It's still to be complemented with supervision. Right. I think those are great points that you hit on. I, I know that you've mentioned this on your website. I was looking at it earlier today and going through the content that you have there. And it really does outline a lot of information for new time owners. So that's a great resource for people to look at. With that being said, I know we talked a lot about what to expect, how to arrange your house or different ways we can interact with our dog and how your dog can, their personality can really be leading and telling towards, you know, the lifestyle that you've built. With that being said, if I'm bringing a new dog into a new environment, is it a bad idea to be working full time and integrating a new member into my family? Or should I be you know, scheduling to take time off of work? What should that look like for someone new? Well, first off, if you're asking that question, I think you're on the right track because really what, it, what you have to do is have a plan and understand what you're getting into. So some dogs are going to adapt to spending time alone during the day without too much difficulty. While other dogs, you know, perhaps higher drive or working dogs like my Border Collie yeah. uh, might struggle more with less physical and especially mental stimulation. So those are the kinds of things you want to think about. Knowing it's a big time commitment after and before work, are you going to have the ability to properly exercise and spend time with the dog? Especially depending on the age of dog, you might want to have a plan for your village. You know, who is going to be able to be enlisted to help? a friend or a family member, or, or maybe you hire someone during the day when you aren't available. Puppies especially need more bathroom breaks and exercise during the day. So you absolutely can make it work with a plan in place in order to make sure that the dog's needs are getting looked after. And the only encouragement I would give is just knowing that the first six months are so crucial to establish that bond and that relationship between you and your dog. So However possible, you know, making the animal a priority so that you can establish that is going to pay dividends in the long run. And you're going to have a, you know, an amazing relationship with an animal for a really great portion of your life. Yeah. And when we think about creating that bond with your animal, does that change when we're looking for a therapy animal or an emotional support animal? Like, is there any difference between a household pet that everybody is going to be, you know, loving and being involved with versus a dog really supporting someone that is going through anxiety or depression or maybe ASD or anything like that? I actually think the breed has less to do with mental health than the actual dog and the fit between the person and the animal. Just like with human relationships is what you're looking for. We all have our types and certain energies that we're prone to connecting with. So you really have to find the right dog for your personality. And, you know, it, it's worth saying that the wrong dog could aggravate a mental illness rather than improve it. And so that is really why you do your research and, and try and figure out what is your real lifestyle, not a romanticized one. And how is that going to be impacted by bringing this animal into your environment? There's a good reason that many service dogs are often sporting breeds like, you know, retrievers or, or labs or springers because they're they're known to be also good family dogs as well. Dogs who are instinctually inclined to tune in to a human companion are usually those who have been bred to work closely with and take direction from humans. You know, I know that in Border Collies and in, in their sheep herding background, but the example is uh, numerous. And at the same time, one person might want a dog who is keenly in tune with their emotions and likely to become a comforting lap dog. Well, someone else might actually prefer a dog who's quietly present. And so thinking about that is what's going to lead you in the right direction to ask questions and go and spend time at dog shows or, or local training organizations, interacting with friends and understanding what their lifestyle is, not just what they have to say about their particular breed. 
Those are really great points. My question was more so directed around training. So if the dog is going to be a support therapy animal for an individual, is it that sole individual is going to be going to maybe all of their dog training classes together to make sure that bond and that connection is stronger versus, you know, a family dog where they're sharing that responsibility on in terms of commands and, you know, how they're training that dog? That's a great point. Absolutely. Um, We love to say people should really have a primary owner in terms of the training process so that they can work and uh, move forward together. What dog training success really comes down to is consistency and repetition from a leader that is positive and fair and can give the right guidance at the right time so that the dog can learn through that consistency and repetition. And so having you know, one person take the bulk of the responsibility on for the training can often be a great strategy, especially as you say, if there's a a real clear intention in mind about what you're hoping to get out of the relationship. And in general, you know, training is a very big commitment, but it's obviously something that I believe is totally worthwhile. And living with a dog who is respectful, understands that there are some rules in life and listens well is a pleasure. So it's totally worth it. So we know that over the pandemic, there's been a large number of people that have decided to adopt a dog. I read somewhere recently that one third of Canadians welcomed a new pet into their lives. When we think about that number, can you talk to us a bit about how pets can get us through a rough time? And maybe there might have been a correlation there. Yeah, definitely. I think the thing that is so present for us right now is the pandemic that we've all just gone through. And of course, there's been a Russian dog ownership, but peeling that back a little bit more and trying to understand what that's about, I think is, is why right now this conversation is so timely to be having. And clearly people have been separated and socially distanced and isolated and having a constant source of companionship and, and love and affection is something that we all can benefit from. You know, there's the oxytocin system that is really involved with bonding and can provide a whole slew of different benefits that I'm sure you could speak to. But one thing in particular that really grabbed my attention is that there were studies in the last two years that have shown that people have been inspired to continue with those routines and live as normally as possible for the sake of their pets. And so the impact of the pets is just really multifaceted. And you see that not just now, but you know, in, in so many different ways. I've come across research in areas that talk about pet owning domestic violence survivors. And many of them have talked about how they were motivated to seek safety, not just for their own sake, but for the safety of their pets. And so I think that the relationship and the depth of connection that we have with these animals is striking and incredible and and very far reaching. And I think you bring up a really good point there, because when we think about effects that the global pandemic has had, like when we look at our rates across the board, prior I was working in children mental health and we saw certain rates absolutely spike. And a part of it was it's not natural to see the same people every single day without social interactions from other places. Like it's normal to see your family or your cohort that you're living with and have those nuances and those normal day-to-day reactions. But then if you're not leaving, you know, your four walls and going to work or heading to the gym or going to preschool to pick up and having those social interactions, we start to see a new trend and a new routine come into play. And what a dog does for you, even during the pandemic, is it keeps you on a regimen. I always say to clients, it takes about two weeks to really get into a routine. The first week's the hardest. The second week, after you get through that hump, your body starts to crave certain things. And a dog allows you to do that naturally and allows you to integrate certain things in your life because someone is dependent on you. Mm. So, I mean, if you were just staying in your house, eventually, even if you weren't taking them for a walk, you would be bringing them out into your backyard. So it's that component of, you know, getting fresh air, Mm. even if it's just for five minutes, we know that that's enough to ground you and have a reset. So people that are experiencing high stress, high anxiety, five minutes is all you really need to have a grounding moment, take a break, allow your nervous system to decompress, and then go back into your house. 
That's why there's so many reports where, you know, dogs have this ability to lower your heart rate. If you're breathing really fast, they're great on picking that up, especially your family pet mm. that's around you all the time and right. you know, you know, kind mm. of what your baseline is. So having a lick on the face or even those lap dogs to come mm -hmm. and have that pressure on you and give your nervous system that grounding sensation that it needs to bring you into the present day is so awakening. Yeah, no question. I heard of a study where 75% of pet owners have reported mental health improvements from their pet ownership. And I think almost 90% of doctors have said that it improves their patients' moods. So there is the research to back up what we are all kind of feeling in our day-to-day -day lives as well. But one piece that really uh, made me chuckle this morning was I saw that pet owners tend to laugh more than non-pet owners. And it actually broke that out into saying not just in reactions to funny behaviors and cute things that your dogs do, but also to spontaneous laughter. And uh, I think that's a really beautiful image of uh, a specific thing that dog ownership and spending time with an animal can, can change about your life. So I have a theory about that. I have a lot of clients that are huge dog lovers as well. And it's probably the one of the reasons why we bond so well in our therapy sessions. And oftentimes people will tell me, I just chat away. My dog knows all my secrets. Hmm. And the great thing is I know he's not going to tell anybody. My secrets are safe with them. And when I have a client come in and they've recently become a dog owner, I can notice that their confidence slowly starts to build because I think they finally have this outlet. Mm. And out of all of the people that I've been working with, it seems to be a trend. Do you notice that in training sessions when you meet first time dog owners or, you know, do you see the dog owner's personality evolve through being with their dogs? I love what you said there about this idea that they can be your confidant and that they will show up from a non-judgmental space and that you can always count on them to be sort of honest with you. And if they're with you, they have no hidden agenda. I, I think that's what came up for me when you said that. And when people are struggling, it's because they don't understand how the dogs think and why they do the things they do. And as humans, we tend to assign human values and emotions to dogs. And that kind of sets us both up for disappointment. So what we've always said at McCann Dogs is that we actually train humans to train dogs. Because if we trained the dogs, they would listen to us and it wouldn't be a sustainable thing. And what the training is actually doing is it's teaching the human how to better understand how the dog thinks and then how to communicate with the dog in a way that they understand so that we're able to teach them solid listening skills and then help them learn how to behave appropriately. And it has a lot to do with this idea that you're, you're hitting on where, you know, dogs unfortunately can't talk to us, can't talk back to us. So we really have to learn how to have a nonverbal communication by figuring out the way that they think and the way that they learn and catering our relationship to find that clear sense of communication. I think those nonverbal skills that you can learn when having an animal is also really important for how we communicate our emotions as adults and for children. Mm. Oftentimes, our default emotion is to be angry because angry sums everything up. It sums up sadness, loss, grief, mm. or confusion even. Being angry sometimes is our staple statement of what we say when we can't make sense of something. Mm. And if you're constantly using skills that are nonverbal to communicate with someone or a pet that you love, you're exercising the skills that you need in the sensation to be able to communicate your needs verbally to other people around you as well. When we think about having a therapy animal, and or a service animal in general, we know that we're looking for certain traits. We want an animal that, you know, doesn't get spooked by loud noises. We want someone that is really compassionate. Like when I think of a child on the autism spectrum that might accidentally hit or have their arms flaring when they're really upset, like a dog that won't re react to accidentally being hit if that happens. Are there certain breeds that are more inclined to be, you know, more open to those situations than others? Yeah, I, th I think you identified a number of really important areas there. Um, you know, sensitivity to sound or sort of uh, reactivity would be why a, a sporting breed, you know, a retriever, a golden, a poodle, a lab, maybe 
better than say a border collie who is you know highly stimulated and highly sensitive and 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 hyper alert. So you do see a lot of trends and patterns uh, with regard to that, and I think that it really does depend on the individual dog and finding that fit. There could be fit in a number of different breeds, and you know it is um, important that all of the factors between the handler, the environment, and the particular personality of the dog are taken into account. When a person, you know, has PTSD and can be brought back into the moment, amazing things can happen. I think if a kid has autism and is paired with the right breed and the right dog, amazing things can happen. You know, I've had the good fortune of connecting with uh, war veterans that have just had incredible life-changing experiences by being matched with the right uh, support animal. So there are a whole bunch of different types of uh, roles and jobs out there. And really, it's about finding the right fit between the breed and, uh, and the owner. Dan, so I'm just curious, um, because you've had a lot of experiences with dogs, I know that you mentioned that for a stint of time that you were also going to long-term care facilities. Was there ever a really unique interaction that a dog had with someone living in that uh, center? For me as a, a younger guy, it was almost a little bit overwhelming to go in with my animal who I loved and I was you know, so used to interacting with in a different environment. So it was a lot to sort of take on. And I think one uh, story that I heard of in particular that really captured my, my heart was uh, there was a lady that had been in a, in a long-term care facility and had gone nonverbal and, and hadn't been communicating uh, externally for a number of years. And the support staff, you know, were working with it best they could, but really finding it difficult to to bring her out and to connect with her. And when uh, the support animals came just just for some visits, it must have pulled at something deep inside her because she actually started talking to the dog after not speaking for years. And it ended up being a little bit of a, a channel because from there, the nurses could ask her questions about the dog and, and she would ask when the dog was coming next. And it would kind of reopen the conversation lines that had been closed for a long time. So as I got older, I realized this just extreme benefit and uh, boost in morale and wellness that can be possible by, by doing that. Our classes at McCann Dogs are often full of older students who in some ways you might think would have different ch uh, challenges with mobility or other areas. But when you see the connection between the individuals, it really warms your heart because it's clear that the bond is so strong. And when I think of empty nesters that have, you know, used to have a full home, I see it in my mother in terms of how a dog came into her life in her mid fifties and just totally changed her life. And I think every life stage can benefit from relationships with with dogs. Wow. You talked about your sister having, you know, her specialty was really loving agility and training that aspects with dogs. Is there one that really speaks to you, like one part of training that you really love and feel passionate about? If you had to pick one thing, I know you love it all. <laughs> no, that's a good, it's a good question. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is kind of silly, but trick training, like it just brings people so much joy. And what I think people don't actually give credit about trick training, I'm talking shake a paw, spin, roll over, and it can get way more advanced than that, is it really helps build your relationship and your bond with, with your dog. And so that is worth its weight in gold. For me, I really enjoyed competing in this dog with my Border Collie growing up. I actually was taught to throw a uh, Frisbee by the Guinness World Record holder for the longest throw by a human and the longest throw and catch by a human and dog. And so uh, it's one of my favorite things to do is to play Frisbee with, with my Border Collies. I'd probably have to pick that uh, in terms of a sport, trick training in terms of the bond. And overall, just seeing a dog learn and problem solve right. and figure something out is a really exciting thing because it changes the dynamic in which you can communicate through nonverbal ways. And they figure out how to tell you that they need to go outside. They figure out how to tell you they're hungry or they figure out, you know, any slew of things. And, you know, someone in my family, myself included, would sort of laugh and marvel at how smart the dogs are when you set them up for success and they understand how to communicate with you. So yeah, watching a dog learn is pretty special. You know what? It's really funny. You said shake a paw and you are right how far back a bond with a dog can go. I... When I was younger, our next door neighbors, I 
I've known this dog since I was three, and then the family moved when I was about 13 years old, and it was their family dog. But one of the first tricks that I learned how to do with this dog, because I'm a bit older than their kid, was shake a paw. Uh-huh. And as soon as you said that, my reaction, I like had a smile. I was actually quite distracted, because all I could remember is this black lab that we grew up beside. And that was like my first interaction with a dog. So mm. even that response that I got from just thinking about that relationship years ago, I I can now see how that would be so impractical for someone that sees their dog every single day and sharing that with them. Yeah, what an interesting insight, the power of that memory. Clearly, it was something that was incredibly impactful. And sometimes, you know, you would know better than me, but sometimes some of our earliest memories that are imprinted can be things connected to fear or, or, or upsetting things. And so it's beautiful to bring back memories that's connected to something so pure and joyful. Dogs are great companions while they're with us, and they can be great companions when they're not with us as well. Like remembering that insight, if I was, you know, in a moment where I was hyper aroused or maybe I was having anxiety or a panic attack, Thinking about a memory that I had with someone that I share a very special bond is known to really de-escalate people in the moment. And, you know, just by thinking of that interaction of shaking a paw and having that smile on my face and having that breath regulate could be something that also happens in everyday life with someone that has that interaction with their dog when they're with them and when they're not. Absolutely. That's a beautiful way of thinking about the loving legacy that they can leave with us. Dan, I really enjoyed talking to you today. I feel like I learned so much more about dogs and being a person that is currently looking for a dog myself. It was more comforting having to hear this information. I think you've inspired a lot of people to you know, think more seriously about dogs and mental health in general. Thanks. There's very few conversations that I'm more passionate about than this one. So it was a pleasure being here and getting to spend this time with you. Dogs have been a big part of my life and will certainly always continue to. And if there's a way to help uh, inspire others to improve and empower and deepen that relationship with a four-legged family member, that's something that we are driven to do at McCann Dogs and that I'm certainly driven to do every single day. So thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much, Dan. That was our host and clinical lead of mental health, Samantha Charon, in conversation with Dan McCann of McCann Dogs Training. Remember to rate and subscribe to Eat, Move, Think on your favorite podcast platform. Follow McCann Dogs on Instagram and Twitter at M-C-C-A-N-N Dogs and check out their YouTube channel, McCann Dogs Training. Follow our host, Sean Francis, on Twitter and Instagram at Sean C. Francis, that's Sean with a U, and follow MedCan on Twitter and Instagram at MedCan Live Well. We'll post episode highlights and links you can visit on our website, eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Eat Move Think is produced by Ghost Bureau. Senior producer is Russell Gregg. Jasmine Ratch is managing producer. Social media and strategy support is from Chantel Gertin and Andrew Imex. Executive producer is Christopher Shulgin. We'll be back soon with a new episode examining the latest in health and wellness. This podcast is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation or endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with the specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.